this is Katie Vogue, the voice of Little Washu. Welcome to Tenchi Cast. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the next exciting episode of the interview adventures from TenchiCast, presented by TenchiForum.com and TenchiMuyoWiki.com. When one generally thinks of Tenchi Muyo, the first thing they think of are its cast of colorful characters. And among that cast of beloved characters is a small red-headed character with a personality bigger than the galaxy she's in. And today, we have the pleasure, privilege, and honor of talking with the woman who brought that character to life with a voice that is often duplicated, but never, ever been replicated, the one and only KT Vote. Oh, I have, a, I have an interesting um, little nugget to tell you before we even start, mm. that there's nothing that you would not know um, because it was an audition and then um, I got cast and then it was not meant to be, but... They did, they were going to do a new speed racer. And so I don't know about you fellas, but um, is fellas right? Are you both identified as cis males? I don't yes. know. Yes. Yeah, we all Be- are. Yeah. Beautiful. Okay. I'm, um, I am she, her, just so you know. Um, mm-hmm. And so I got to go in and, and uh, when I was a kid in high school, we would watch, we would sneak, we would sneak watch speed racer because we weren't allowed to watch television. And. Our favorite was, it was Spridal and Chim Chip, of course, were their, our favorite. So we, around our house, and I'm the oldest of eight kids, would do those voices, right? And they were, they were so bizarre because we'd never seen um, Japanese anime dubbed in English before or the other way. And um, so we were, like, confused and, and delighted at how they would do things that were crazy, you know, like it didn't make sense, the cadence of things, right? We're like, why are they saying things in such a bizarre, chopped up way? And then I realized they have to match the lip flaps you know, later on when I was doing this. But I got called in to read for both Trixie and Spritle. And I got cast as Spritle. And then they wanted to change the concept of the new Speed Racer to make uh, Spritle like, you know, a teenager, which, you know, I don't think it ever, <laughs> nothing happened. But to get to audition for that, my brothers and sisters that I got cast as the new Spritel was, was pretty fantastic. Wow. Right? I certainly did not know that. Wow. That's really Yeah. Cool. I mean, it was just an audition, right? And it never came to be, but it was one of those things that you're like, oh my God, art is imitating life. You know, it was just very surreal and wonderful. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. That's how are you guys wow. doing great? Especially get get to talk to you. So how did you guys meet each other? That's just, it's like, how did you, was it over your love of certain things or what was it? So I uh, created a website called Tenchi Forum. And that's pretty much how the three of us met over the years. And uh, we've traveled many, many miles together. We went to conventions together. And so Tenchi Cast, the podcast as well. Because Tenchi Forum is a big community of people. We'll have new people come in. It's not just always the same people. We have new fans and new people coming in to give their perspectives on stuff whenever we do an episode on something. But usually when we do like an interview like this, it's like the core cast, the the staff of Tenchi Forum, if you will. Yeah, that's fantastic. No, um, Matt's interview was from a long time ago. Yeah. Or at least the one you shared. Before that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, or yes, that's so, that's so cool though. Cause you have so much to talk with and it doesn't, I mean, it's nice to have um, maybe people who've done it pop in, but you have so much to talk about that. I mean, I want to check it out for sure. I only listened to Matt's thing, but I really enjoyed it. Please send me information on how to listen to them because they're pretty great. Really appreciate that. Yeah. We, uh, there's a lot to talk about in Tenchi Muyo cause it's a, it's a huge franchise. It's like an iceberg. You think, yeah. you, you think you've seen the top of it. And the more that you dive, the more that you find. I don't think there's anything like it. It is. You know, an enigma. I mean, yeah, it is just like, um, was it? I can't think of his name. They described him as an enigma. The guy who did um, Sanford and son. What's his name? God damn it. 
Oh. It'll pop into my head later. Right? Yeah. They called him an enigma because there's nobody like him. Either. Red Fox. That's right. I have a good story about Red Fox because, you know, I'm in, in the entertainment industry, so I hear weird stories every once in a while. Okay, mm-hmm. so Red Fox um, is hilarious, and he was a filthy stand-up comedian before he got his television show. And in his later years, he became extra cranky. So he would, so when we'd go stand up, do stand up, they would play his entry song to Sanford and Son, which is da 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 da. And one time he was so cranky, he was like, "Shut the fuck up!" When he came into his entry, which I thought was a good story. Wow. Oh man, wasn't he was, feeling he was it. Just, then. He was is bitter. He was bitter. Oh, geez. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so oh, I'm sorry. I keep on tangenting. That's how I talk. I told you earlier. I the filthiest thing I ever did was on Tenchi, right? I mean, not you know, on my own private life. I'm sure filthier, but like um, in recorded, like in voiceovers or TV or movie or stuff, or even stage. You know, the filthiest thing I did in Tenchi, and I think you know what episode it is, and I think you know what scene it is too. I think so. Yeah. 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 And yep. I was going on. I was going on to YouTube. And I was trying to find that line and they don't have the line on YouTube. So what I did was, and I don't know why I didn't do it earlier. And although it could be in the house somewhere and I just have lost it. I ordered the DVD. You guys inspired me to order the DVD of all of the episodes. How I know that it was popular when I was signing autographs. And what I do is I always draw a picture of my character because I, I can draw and then I'll sign it. You know. And somebody, some guys, they were a cluster of guys came up and said would you do the line from episode blah 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 like because they knew that and i didn't know what they were talking about because i never think of episodes in in numbers i think about them in like what went on in them or something you know and i said what do you want me to say he goes you know say it and i was like oh is it was it um let's shake the dew off this lily something like that that's it it's the one that's i was thinking one. of yep yeah <laughs> well i mean she actually says because I had to, I had to look at it. I said, "Can I take a sperm sample?" And he's like, "What? Huh?" And then she offers to do it in many different ways because she's very thoughtful, and it's for science. For science. See, it's for science, and she looks like it's like the most twisted washu. I mean, it's the most twisted of the characters because she looks so underaged, right? But she's five thousand years old, so it's like. What a genius move, right? She can say all this screwed up shit, and it's fine because she's she's older than the Golden Girls. That's pretty right? old. Yeah, she can. I really old. I said five thousand years old, but Betty White's older than that. May she rest in peace. Um, but um, yes, but um, so that was like it was a genius thing. You guys must talk about that because um, what a way to get away with doing things that are very borderline you know, non-PC. And of course, when it was done, there's a lot of stuff done that was non-PC, but um, the genius of having somebody who looks like jailbait be several thousand years old is just freaking genius. She always was dressed like a schoolgirl. That's uh, something that anime has kind of been able to get away with a little bit more of, you know, by having younger looking characters. Yes. And then, you know, making up, something about how they're you know or an alien or you oh, know com- totally that's so smart because you from- can't i think that's why um uh, uh animation like uh, do you watch um loud mouth are you or thinking of maybe is sorry, it big, big mouth? mouth big mouth sorry yeah well, I've, heard, mouth. I've heard of that i watched some of that yeah well yeah, it's not I mean. an it's not anime but what they do is they get away with shit you could never get away with with live people and I think that's genius because it's number one, it's a great show. And our daughter told us about it, right? So she's like, when she was watching, it was like 18 or 19, you know? And it was, it's so open about sex and it's done in such a brilliant way. And um, you could never, never, never do it if you were doing it with people. Right. And that's uh, John Mulaney and uh, yeah. what's his name? Is it Nick Kroll? Is that what I'm yep, that's thinking? it. Perfect. They, that's exactly they are- it. They have great chemistry. They are. Yes. They're a riot. I got to see them in New York. (laughs) Yeah. I got to see them in New York. I haven't been to New York very many times, but we went in 2016 because our child said, you have to take me to New York. And I was like, all right, to see plays. And we're like, you're right. So we went to New York and we saw like seven plays in five days or something. 
And um, one of them we saw was, I'm going to say it wrong. Is it, oh, hello? That's what I think it was. Yeah. Oh, yeah, hello. Was, oh, oh, hello. <laughs> and the thing was, she was already hip to those guys. I mean, I, I'd seen Nick Kroll because I watched Parks and Rec and other things he'd, he'd pop in on. But um, I hadn't seen John Mulaney yet, right? And so my first introduction to him and Nick Kroll were at, him was um, as old men. And so it took me forever to see him as a young man because he was so good in that play. And he played it. They played a couple of old Dodgers. It was fantastic. Yeah, really. And uh, yeah, John Mulaney. Well, we millennials love John Mulaney. Oh, yeah. He's kind of oh, our, my God. our thing. <laughs> and yeah, Nick. There's Kroll, nobody I'm, better. Oh, yeah. He's just, uh, man, uh, I think he wrote for uh, SNL, uh, oh, yeah. you know, yeah. before doing the stand up thing or before that took off anyway. And uh, yeah. I remember Nick Kroll in a show called The League. Um, oh, okay. It was about fantasy football, and uh, oh yes, yes, yes. It, it was it was crass at that, but it was it was funny. There was a lot of mm-hmm. funny moments in that. So yeah, he's very talented as well. Uh, they're, yeah. they're a great. That deal. show is is genius. That show is genius. I always thought that when I was a kid, you grow up and then you don't watch cartoons anymore, which as a kid made me sad. And I am so glad that I live in a world where you can read graphic novels, which I always loved, and cartoons as an adult. And, and it's so great. It's evolved into something that is better than a lot of live, a lot of live action, you know, genius. Oh, oh yeah. And anime, too. Like Anime, an- yeah. Absolutely. Anime now has become so mainstream. That oh, my God. That was, you know, actually one of the things I wanted to ask you about was, you know, were you a stage actor first? Yes, I, I was trained in, in theater. Um, I'm from Illinois and I was trained in, in theater. And I did like when I was young, I would do plays in school and some community theater. Then I went away to college to major in theater because my parents were really nice. They tried to do what a lot of parents at the time did, which was at least get a teaching degree. And I was like, if I taught, I'd be a bitter actor. So sorry, I'm not going to do that, which is kind of gross on my part. But then I came out to this coast um, and attended the Pacific Conservatory for the Performing Arts in Santa Maria, California, where my daughter is right now. She wants to be an actor, and she's she's amazing. And um, we now, and then for 14 years, I was um, uh, an act, a stage actor at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival, and we just came home here back to Los Angeles a few months ago. So, wow. and we had rented we had rented our house out at the time, and now we're back in our house, which is really nice. Before then, I did you know a little bit of movies, a little bit of TV, a little bit of commercials a little bit of theater for free because if you do theater for in los angeles it's um you do it under like the equity waiver thing where you didn't get paid but i didn't care because i'd have enough money coming in from other things and um it's really live theater keeps you kind of sharp you know which is great so yes trained in theater long answer to a short question go off as long as you want (laughs) <laughs> it's like an, this thing's an hour right it can go as long as we want to oh, i mean sh- hey just, listen. i mean what's, whatever's comfortable for you i will not be angered or or at all upset say okay it's time to go but i think we should try to keep it around you know not too much more than an hour i think that's just crazy who can listen to that i mean you know i i mean it's just too it's asking too much you know for people um but um the thing the thing that got me into animation was one of the people who directed me in more shows than I've ever been directed by any other director was John C. Fletcher, known as Jack Fletcher, right? And he was looking to cast, um, same, very similar to Matt, except he didn't know Matt, you know? He's, he was looking to cast Washu, and he says, I think you could do this, come in an audition. And I was like, okay, I'd never done any animation or anything. Uh, I'm friends with him and his uh, sister, really good friends with his sister. And so he has me, and he's worked with me, right, in many plays. And um, I come in and I auditioned for Washu and I kind of use my own voice, right? And he says to me, he goes, because they don't want to use you because your voice is too low. I was, like, I was like, well, I was just using that voice. I can do any voice. He goes, I know that's what I told him. So I came back and I was like, hey, you know, and they're like, oh, you can change your voice. It's like, oh my God, you know? So a lot of times... Yeah, I know. But here's the thing is like a lot of people just don't know that. And that's okay if they give you a chance or give you some feedback so that, you know, if you can change something, you know, that's that's great. So I was lucky to get that because, you know, they were like, no, we need a person who has a high voice. And I was like, wow, you know, so it was 
that was cool, you know. And like Matt talked about is like the back when they first did it, and I know it's different now because I, you know, I have friends who work at Netflix and stuff. Um, you know, they have that time code and then you have to match voice flaps. I mean, mouth flaps. And there's like a little beep, beep, beep. Then you have to have the timing to go into it. And um, it was very hard at first and very, um, uh, it was very, really challenging. And what I was pr- really proud about is that I never really freaked out, even though it was nothing that I had ever done before, you know? Um, so it was, it was great that um, he had the patience with me to find the way to do that and, you know, be in a, in a booth for the first time, working on headphones for the first time, with a microphone for the first time, with a monitor and all that stuff for the first time. So it was um, a real blessing that he gave me that chance, you know, because there were many seasoned professionals who I, I'm sure he could have chosen. And one of the things I ended up doing, and this isn't Washu, but it's a segue into like um, other animation things that I've done that you may or may not know about is um, he had some project, Jack Fletcher had some project that um, he said, could you write, here's the, here's the music to this, um, this person in, in this show called Psycho Diver. I don't know if you about, know about that. So Psycho Diver, um, he wanted me to, um, he, he told me what basically the translation of the song was, what, what it was about in um, Japanese. And then he said, here's the music. And if you could write the song and sing it, that'd be great. <laughs> And, and I, what was great is that with him, because I worked with him so much in theater and then in, in um, Tenchi, is he trusted me to do something that I'd never done in my life before or never would have thought of doing, right? But because he said that, I was like, okay, you know? And then I was like, what? And then I just did it, you know? So it was really cool that um, I got to explore other aspects of that sort of thing. And he really empowered me. And I got to um, work on um, Princess Mononoke, which he directed. and. He wanted me to be in charge of the factory woman's chorus. And it was just great. You know, he gave me a lot of, um, he endowed me with, with powers that I didn't know I had. Right. So that was a great experience. Shout out to Jack then. Good old Jack. Yeah, shout out to Jack. <laughs> Good old Jack. Have you ever met him? We haven't had the pleasure. No, but, um, you know, I, uh, from other, uh, you know, actors and stuff, uh, I've heard nothing but good things. So that's, yeah. that's great to hear you know, more about yeah. him and, and he really helped make Tenchi special. Very, very true. Yeah. Um, also talking about, you know, when you had first gotten into Tenchi, uh, do you remember exactly what year that was that you started dubbing Tenchi? Well, I was looking at your timeline, right? And I, God, I, what Tenchi came out in, in the dubbed version, did you say like 1990? As as far as we know, uh, the first release of Tenchi Muyo ever being dubbed came out in late 1993. Uh, okay, I feel like we did it earlier than that, right? And it just took a while. Like, what I would do is I'd look at when the Japanese Tenchi aired in Japan, right? And I don't know how long it took uh, Pioneer or whoever was in charge to um, release it in english but i feel like i did it even earlier than that you know that it could have been like 1990 even but i could be just you know i can't i can't i don't know i was gonna say do you remember like the month do you remember like uh oh my god no it, well I just if there was anything no i mean i i love that you think that i mean i do know people who have that kind of mind oh um, I, but it was I, a long I'm, time ago I'm, it was 30 I'm, years ago <laughs> say well yeah yeah, but there's some things, there's odd things that I actually do remember, you know, and I don't know why that is one of them because it was a really unique experience. I, if I do find out, I will, um, I'll tell Absolutely. you, Absolutely. you know, so those are like the fun facts that I, I probably should have prepped for if I, cause I know some people who are on, you know, who did it like, um, John Demita is married to Julia Fletcher. And I think both of them probably did voices on Tenchi, right? Um, I believe so. Yeah. Yes. And they're uh, best friends of ours. So um, they, John is like, he has that kind of mind. So he might remember, so I can ask them, them that, you know, it's, it's funny that we are, I'm actually very close friends with 
Jack's sister and her husband, and we, you know, see each other all the time. Um, it's kind of great that uh, we have that in common, you know. I mean, they're wonderful actors, and it just happened that they knew Jack. So when he was starting out on that, he used these people who just have to be great. He didn't know Matt, but then, you know, he, of course he used Matt all the time because in Matt's interview, he said he just happened to have that gift about being able to do those mouth flaps and do great characterizations and acting with it, which is definitely a freaking skill. I have other friends who, who are wonderful actors and very versatile actors who absolutely freaked out at that, that thing. They couldn't do it, right? And Because it's a, it's a weird, I was just lucky, I think. I didn't think about it. If I would have thought about it too much, maybe it w- I would have psyched myself out. But um, I didn't. And, and like, like I said, Jack just believed in me and I didn't ever question it, which was really a great gift, you know? Oh, for sure. And, you know, speaking yeah. of Jack and uh, him having so much trust and faith in you, uh, what was it kind of like just dubbing Wash You on a day-to-day basis as you went into the do recording sessions? Well, they would be really intense, right? Like I remember Matt saying sometimes it was like seven hours or something. And it was very long. One of my favorite ones was when I, I was going in to, to dub um, Tenshi up in Studio City, like off of Laurel Canyon and Ventura. That I can't remember the name of that place. It might be still there. But I, I walk in there. It's a very small little place. Um, very nice, though. And Tim Curry is sitting out there, right? Because I think wow. he was dubbing something. Yeah. And I said, I love you. Said, I love you too. And I just walked in and started dubbing. Because you can tell he was nice. There's certain people you can just tell are delightful. And he's one of them. So you never knew who you were going to run into there, right? Um, it was a long, oh, oh, sometimes um, I would, on a long session, get what they call, is, what, what they call in the industry is mouth noise, right? So mouth noise is a thing. And um, he would say, bite on a green apple. So I'd have a green apple in there with me. And if I started getting that smacky sound, you know, I'd bite on it and stop it. That's a, that's a real thing. Like, you get kind of a, I think now, I don't even know if you have to work in manipulating. I don't know if that's a thing anymore in animation. But it was for, for us, especially if you went on for so a long time you just get like your mouth gets dry and um it's it's a very intense you're exhausted when you're done with that right focus is like i never did it enough to be like oh it's a stroll in the park like i'm sure some people have you know but tenchi is all that i really did consistently and then i was lucky to do like princess mononoke and psycho dive and some other odd things you know but um never that it was so much right because if you think about it um and washu was you know she was like an amuse bouche like she was in not in it too much but she was very effective when she was in it right so i never did a lot of like so many hours so it never became super comfortable it became more familiar and more less horrifying to do it but it was never really comfortable and what was great is that jack has a fantastic sense of humor and he would be nice and goofy which would take the edge off of it right and you could crack him up and he wasn't like, hurry up and dub. Like he liked it when weird stuff would come up and sometimes he would use it. So there was a little bit of um, improvisational, which is what I, I like to do. It's like I'm good without a script and I like to just be let free and to do stuff. And, and so you had the blend of extreme precision and also like you'd say, okay, here I need you to make a bunch of weird sounds. Or if I was di- like doing one of the cabots, you know, then I could, you know, or if I wasn't, my mouth wasn't on screen, then sometimes there was some room for um, more flexibility, you know, for stuff. So uh, when you were dubbing and you were talking, we were talking earlier about the line, was that something that, you know, Jack, you would see the original Japanese and then you'd see the English version and then. Oh, yeah. uh, Would he tell you to change it if it didn't work? It seems like you had a lot of flexibility. Oh, yeah, totally. Absolutely. Um, he would try things and he had a good sensibility, like like shaking the dew off this lily was such a classier thing than the original. I don't know if you saw what the original was, but it was you no, know, not at all. Uh, it was it wasn't done um, in an artistic way. Right. It was very straightforward. And so he would get the same results by doing something that was it didn't have to be so obvious. Everybody knew what he was talking about. Let's shake the dew off the lily rather than the exact thing that she was doing. Right. So he was great at coming up with 
delightful and classy ways of of saying the things that because tenchi very intense and vulgar right in a lot of it right um and so uh the american tried to be a little more um still do all that because it's funny but also it's funny when you can think of a hilarious uh uh (laughs) alternative to just saying i'm going to whack you off right so that was that was his <laughs> that was his superpowers he so he's definitely open to you know other kinds of things like that you know um so uh i'm sorry i meant jack you off jesus um anyway so that's what he was great at because i think he also uh did the um he and his wife ellen i think did the um translations right they had they did the translation and then they he directed the script the script right so he was very familiar with how things worked and he was also trusted the actors he hired if a word didn't work you try other things it's like well let's try this instead so it was really um very creative and very empowering you know because he did you know so much of the work and then you find details that either changed because of things that just came up or like maybe the producers needed something different. So then you come up with something else. And it was so it was great. You never knew what you were going to get to uh, do, you know. And I'd go over, um, I'd have the, um, the script and stuff ahead of time so I could try to get comfortable with it. So there was a lot of work involved. It wasn't just showing up at the studio. You had to do, for, for myself, I had to do a lot of prep ahead of time to get comfortable with um, the words so you wouldn't have to be glued to the page, right? You could look up at the monitor. and So it was a very interesting <laughs> skill set. Did yeah, I answer sure. your question? No, no. I, yeah, definitely. And okay. uh, that got me thinking because um, we've all seen it here uh, on home video uh, in the many years since. But, you know, a lot yeah. of us, we were, uh, of all things, we were introduced to it uh, as kids and they, yeah. they put it on TV and you think, how did they make that work? Oh, well, oh my God. they heavily, well, heavily, speed racer. yeah, <laughs> heavily censored and had, um, there was also some, um, alternate dialogue, uh, as we've, we've gone oh, back yeah. and, and cross referenced some of the things like, so, uh, you know, to make it obviously TV, so Y7 did they friendly. Hire, yeah. Did they like hire other actors to do that? Cause I don't remember doing that. Well, yeah, we, I was going to ask you cause I remember, um, I mean, our, I might have, but I don't remember. Yeah, because the results. I don't think that, we did. Huh? Because it, it sounded just like you, and there was there was a line where, well, um, she said something about um, uh, when she goes into her adult true form or what have you, and she says, you know, I yes, I, I want to bear a child with you, Tenchi, and oh yes, that yes. got uh, no, that, that was me, definitely me. Yeah, that got changed to something else. I don't remember what that got softened huh. up a bit. Uh, on tv but it sounded like you maybe we could uh if we find a clip of it we could share it with you or something oh, but I love uh, that. yeah because we're, we're trying to figure that out too you know but it must well have been... it would make sense if they were so smart to look at go ahead and think like have us do while we're in the studio and they're you know uh in the studio to have us do two versions i it have happened i don't really remember it happening though so i'm not sure and i don't think my voice was is that that difficult to impersonate actually because all i did was use my own voice to make it go higher so they could have had somebody easily come and you know people are so good at you know impersonating people and it's not that big of a you know deal i don't think she doesn't talk that much so that, yeah. that'd be interesting if it was a match a i mean match just a, just a couple pickup lines and it was so long ago yeah so it's i don't know that's yes. still kind of yes. a mystery i guess <laughs> that is so interesting i love that i um uh I, I think I'll, I'll ask John and Julia that if they remember that. That's a cool, yeah, because you're stirring up a lot of things. Because, you know, when you're done with a job, you kind of just are done with it. But what was cool was my husband's brother's wife, who taught in Tucson, Arizona, the kids who are, I think are around your age now, they found out that I was, you know, a relative of hers. And so she would ask me when I'd go out to um, visit in Tucson with, with Paul. She asked me to like to do a stack of autographs for her kids. And so I draw pictures and sign them. And I say, how many do you need this time? And so she says, 15. And I just do them. So she gave them to her kids, which was so fun. You know, and I love that. That's so nice of you. And I didn't know uh, that, you know, you were, you could, you were also an artist. You could draw. That's, that's fun too. I, I don't, 
Yeah, totally. Hey, I that. will <laughs> totally send you. Well, why would you? But I mean, I'm not a professional artist, but I'm a good drawer. But um, if you want want autographs, I'll absolutely send them to you. Oh my god! If you wanted to 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 draw that and we put it up on the screen or whatever, like at, sure. at the end or the something of it, <laughs> that would be so fun. If you wanted to do that, oh man, I yeah, absolutely will. <laughs> so give me like an address, and I'll send three. And, oh, or we actually get our own. Wow. Yeah, sure. Uh, we could we could do that. No, you wow. get a piece of paper. You get <laughs> wow. old school. Oh. You get old school. Oh, thank you. Yeah. We, that would. Uh, I'm thinking you can of where do I'm going to. You can do whatever you want with it. You know, I don't care. <laughs> you, can, you can put it. I mean, you can put it in whatever you want, but um, it would be my pleasure to do that. Oh, man. I'm thinking of where I'm going to put it after I frame it. Really. I mean. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Thank you very Where much. Where can't that, you put it? Yeah, man. <laughs> Watch you could make a whole other room. Put for it you. anywhere. That's right. <laughs> I love drawing it. It's so fun. You know, anime is just anime is so fun to draw, right? It's kind of how I drew as a little kid. Like you draw giant eyes and you draw people who kind of look like kids because you're little. And then and then you lo and behold, you grow up and you're like, what the hell? This is like how I drew when I was a kid. I mean, it's more refined and stuff. But it's it's so um childlike in many ways you know yeah and uh i've, I I've mean, seen, I've seen that's a lot why it's of, twisted yeah i'm not an artist <laughs> myself but i've seen a lot uh and know some and and see them on social media and everything and and yeah they just it, it, along with you know anime kind of being more mainstream we're you know seeing seeing a lot of that aesthetic um you know more so it more prevalent in American cartoons and stuff. So it's been really fun seeing over the past 20 some years as, uh, you know, people our age, you know, in their thirties and such are, yes. are working on shows. And we all grew up watching a lot of the same anime. You know? Right. We're, we're right. Seeing that reflected in some of these shows now. So that's, that's really fun. Well, I was, um, my husband and I went to a, a movie and, and um, like the Burbank five or 10 or whatever it is. And, um, we uh the girl taking tickets it was kind of slow so she was drawing and she was drawing anime right (laughs) and i was like wow that's good and and she's like thanks you know so she was like doing that it was like how beautiful you know that that, that's like something that people just enjoy drawing and and why wouldn't you you know yeah we're like her own version yeah that's not her life you know (laughs) exactly exactly it was like very you could tell it was very relaxing for her and i thought that is just fantastic and then after we go past other people like oh what did you like they were it was a great way to do conversate have a conversation with somebody who's looked at as more than a ticket taker right as an artist and i thought that is just fantastic i bet that made her day you know sure but i mean a lot a lot of people we yeah everybody was saying it. so it wasn't you know it wasn't just us it was everybody after us was like what are you drawing it's like yeah. so great <laughs> and she wasn't shy about it which i think is really good because i think especially if you are kind of shy and she kind of seemed like maybe she was she wasn't about her art right and i think that happens with a lot of artists and drawers and writers is that they don't know necessarily how to communicate with people right and this is a way to do it because then they have this starting point where people say that's wonderful. And then all of a sudden they know that somebody is appreciating them and then they can open up more. That's wonderful. You know? Wow. Yeah, that really is. And I bet that's going to be, that's inspirational for a lot of people going to be listening to this. I'm sure really. I mean, you never know who who's hearing this kind of stuff, you know? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) One of the things, you know, you talked about earlier, being at a convention and those guys, I hate that that's kind of like the focal point for a lot of this is that one line, but um, not for that line in particular, but there was a convention that you and Matt were at in the nineties. Yeah. The uh, Los Angeles comic book and sci-fi convention. Okay. Maybe that was it. Maybe it wasn't in, or- in Orange County. I would just think yeah, about this- Orange County as a big convention place. There's actually a, uh, a picture of you and Matt. That's it. Uh, doing uh, autographs yes and uh what what can you tell me about that event what was it like seeing tenchi fans in the wild at that it point after you've been dubbing? oh my god because here's the thing is like um you know you're an actor and nobody you're not a famous actor although here's a weird here's a weird parallel i actually um have to do another horrifying segue are you ready for it Oh, we're ready. ready. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. The other time that I had a weird rush with fame was just a couple years before then, where 
I happened to audition for something that was meant for Andrea Martin. Do you know who she is? She was like on Second City. She was supposed to do this Lysol campaign that was coming out of Canada because she's Canadian. And it was um, the thing was the, the character she did when she was on Second City TV w- with John Candy and all those people, right? Catherine O'Hara, all those people. Rick Moranis, you know, um, was um, this foreign woman where she talked in gibberish, right? And so they wrote a commercial for her and then she declined to do it. And then I went and auditioned and they had gibberish written out on paper and the audition, right? And people were sitting there trying to memorize gibberish. And I said, could I just improvise it? And they said, please. And so I improvised this woman cleaning a house because they had a, the setup was like they had cleaning things. And so I would just be talking as in cleaning. So I was like, eh, oh, but I fetch up the gramba. Lysol, clean, germ, no. You know, so anyway, I got cast. And then I went up to um, Canada to shoot this, right? And I don't know how it's doing because I just did my commercial and came home. And then they say, you have won the best actor in a commercial in Canada. And I was like, oh, that's nice. So, so I fly out to Canada and I get a, an award and I accept it in gibberish, of course. And the Canadians were confused by that. But I thought, why would I break my character? It's just too great. So I'm like, oh, and then I started crying when I got my reward and I, because she's a cleaning lady. I like pulled Kleenex out of my bra and was crying and, and they were just confused, you know, but it was fun. And it was a fancy. Um, so they said, this campaign has done really, really well. We're thinking about doing a series a- around you. And I was like, okay, you know, because this is how things happen. You know, it's so weird. So they said, we want you to be on a radio show, the most famous popular radio show in the morning you know, with these, these, these disc jockeys. Right. And I said, that'll be great. So I go and I'm, I put on my um, cleaning lady outfit. Right. And my, do my hair, my cleaning lady way. And I go there and I only talk in gibberish, which makes one of the guys really angry. But the other guy who was like the sports guy, he was like, you could tell he was the fun one. Like the other guy was like, really, what's your name? I said, Grunya Zinka. And then I go, and I talk. And then, and then, and then the, that guy was super frustrated. He goes, no, I mean your real name. I said, Gronya Zenka. You know, I wouldn't break character. And then the other guy chimed in and goes, wait a minute. Didn't I see you at the 84 Olympics? And I said, how did you about the shot pot? What is your bronze? Robbed of gold. Can I fit you with that? You know, so I would throw in some English so they knew what I was talking about, right? And so he and I just took off, you know, and we would, we, you know, did a long time of improvisation stuff. And then um, it was like a whirlwind, right? Not, but I'm up in Canada. So then I'm on the plane coming back. And they said, they were telling me how popular the commercial was and how well-known it was and everything. And I kind of didn't believe them, right? Because it was, um, and I didn't look like, I, I was so different, even though I didn't look that different without the character that I, I asked one of the steward, stewardesses on the plane. I said, have you ever seen this Lysol commercial? She says, oh yeah, I love that commercial. And I said, I'm that lady. And she's like, what? And so everybody comes over to me. Right. And then this guy sitting behind me goes, Oh my God, I heard your broadcast on the morning show with, you know, these famous guys. He goes, I almost wrecked my car. I was laughing so hard. Right. So you hear things like this and you're like, you just have to trust that it really happened because it is not, did not happen here. Right. And then nothing ever came of it. I mean, I was lucky. I, you know, did that campaign for Canada for a while. They tried it and, the United States, but they thought it was offensive to foreign people. So they, and they also liked how they did it here. You know, they, they weren't open to a different, different um, interpretation, you know? Um, so, so that was like, that's like what happens here. Like you can have like these things happen and you just kind of roll with it and you're like, Oh, okay. You know, and then it either disappears or you have a nice time. I had a nice time, you know, but um, so that was, I don't know why I segued into that. What was your question? I don't even know, but that was cracking me up. And I am Isn't it crazy? My, I'm muting my mic so we can get you recorded properly. But like that that was oh. that was so wild what you just described. Like that's that was so funny to me. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and you would never oh, know God. that, right? No, no, I had no yeah, idea. I mean, that's what it is no to be idea. <laughs> an an actor kind of because you don't know what the hell anything's gonna come from anywhere. Wow, man. It's, Shoot, it's, I, now I can't remember what you were asking me about. Oh, the, it was about the convention. Wasn't it about yeah. the convention? 
Yes. Also, okay. Uh, what was your? <laughs> well, I, I would just say, you know, uh, I actually, I don't know if you can see it in the chat here. I actually put in that picture of you and Matt uh, that they took. Oh, I'll have to look at it later because I'm, I'm actually outside. Oh, okay. Um, in the yard, I'm sweeping <laughs> leaves. But uh, I was just asking, what was it like meeting Tenchi fans after you oh, had been okay. dubbing this for so long? That was it was very similar, right? Because you don't think that anybody thinks anything of you because you don't see it. You're a voice actor, right? Um, you just think it's what a great job. I'm glad people seem to like it. Then you go there and all of a sudden you're like a kind of a weird celebrity, right? And and it was wonderful because it was just one day and the people were so wonderful and sweet. And it, it feels like I get kind of would say like C Cinderella's night at the ball, right? Because then it's like you go back and everything's normal again. But you get to experience this really intense, cool thing, you know? And you always see, there's always, we've all seen those shows where they show conventions and people dressed like Star Trek and all that stuff, right? And and that's that's also true. So it's like you're kind of prepared for it, but it's so wonderful when you see people that, people that care about something so much and their enthusiasm is just beautiful. It's like, it's nice that people allow themselves to really love something, you know, like this. And, and, and I felt like, Oh, who wouldn't want to come here and be around these people. Right. I mean, we got, I know some people go and the more famous people go and they like get money to sign autographs and I didn't get any of that. I couldn't care less. It was like, you got paid for like the day, whatever it was. Right. And then I signed as many things as I could. And I, I think it was for free because, you know, I, I wouldn't think, you know, that uh, I didn't know that people ever charged. Me. Well, I thought like big celebrities did, but so I was signing things and people would have me write something. They'd say how, how great it was, just like what you would think. Right. But who, who would have guessed that I was that person that they were saying that to. Right. Very surreal. Yeah, you probably don't uh, see yourself as a uh, Bill Shatner or a uh, Leonard Nimoy, but <laughs> you right. you got you guys are to a lot of people, you know. Uh, right, and and so what's really cool, you know, it's the coolest thing. We are to young people. There's nothing better than having people who are <laughs> half your age, like think you're cool. Oh my God, what's better than that, right? If it was like people older than me, it's like oh they're gonna die soon. But you guys are young, and it's like oh that's so cool. Oh, here's, I want you to be candid with me, okay? We like how, candid. <laughs> okay, how how jarring is it when you see how we look in real life? I mean, you're like, oh, no, you know? Oh, man. Because, well, I mean, when we were doing it, you know, I was 30, you know, 60 now. So oh, it's yeah. like, a, yeah, and, and fat. So it's like, um, it's like, it's all these things like, oh, you're so beautiful. It's like, yeah, that was all right. You know, nobody <laughs> at the time thought I was, you know, anything but then if people like your character you know then they fantasize about your i don't know but um but then you're like hello i'm the voice of my show you know i mean you must get that all the time and you're like oh i guess she might not go on a date with me <laughs> you know because she's my she's than my mother but um but that kind of thing has got to be weird right i mean i'm just wondering because i i would think it was weird if i was in your your shoes unless Unless they were on social media so much that you already were prepared for the shock, you know, <laughs> but you can go on to, you can go on to IMB and see what I look like. That's a recent photo. And it is not the same that I looked when I was 30. I mean, I think I look all right for my age, but it's not the same thing, you know? Yeah, I'll, I'll have to look, but I, cause I, I haven't seen, but I, you know, we meeting with Patria and Matt and stuff. I, I think you guys all look great. I mean, you know, and that's, that's <laughs> just, that's, you know, that's, that's life, you know, you, you know, absolutely. That, uh, you know, I, so I think you, you all look, look and sound great. You know, well, so. I'm thinking too, if you, if you still are a person who has a, a love of life and you're like enjoying things and you enjoy other people, then it's, you know, people will get over the shock of and the initial, you know, how you look pretty quickly and then they can enjoy what, who you are. Right. Mm. And I, um, so that that to me is like, you know, I love that, you know, I think most people and I mean, it was even it was even like that for us in here. Like we've heard your voice so many times, but as soon as you actually hear it from the person in real life, it's yeah, it, it like that. It puts you in just such a headspace. It's magical. I mean, that's really. Do the, I like her still? 
I mean, I'm okay if I don't. Because I was doing some of the lines. I don't even know if I sound like her anymore. Because it's not something you do, right? You absolutely still sound like her. I mean, that's... I, I do? Oh, yeah. Oh, like the intro you that's did. That's so nice. No, I can I'm still not... play Ingenue with my voice. <laughs> the... Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that's, you know, that's one of the things that we would get, you know, because we've done Tenchi Cast now for, you know, going on 10 years almost as long as the the website has been around and one of the oh, things yeah. one of the things that we always hear from people is you know you got to talk to KT vote you got to talk to KT vote because you know in a show like Tenchi Muyo it's it everybody in the show has a unique voice but yeah. even saying that like Washu's voice nobody sounds like Washu she's nobody. totally twisted right well, and just, I have to say that it's like because, um, you know, I was directed because you don't I didn't understand that show when I did it. Right. I was like, this is is so whack, you know, um, and I just trusted my director and I trusted what the character's motivation was. But but if you describe the person, you're like, oh, kind of anything goes. Right. Because how if you're going to voice somebody who's an otherworldly 5,000 year old scientific genius who is the mother of Ryoko. And did I say her name, right? Mm-hmm. You did. Yep. Thank did. God. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, and, and not a good one, but just, she had done all these crazy things. Right. And then, and then she always, she's like, I would really like to have a child of my own, you know? And then she's like, another time she's like, <laughs> <laughs> you know because he said i need a demonic laugh here and they're like okay what does that mean then you just do it and then jack strikes is like hmm, how about another one so he really makes you do a lot of different things so you get really wacko you know so it was it's so insane to be able to have i mean i'll never play a character with that much range right because she does everything from innocent little school girl to demonic pervert to sweet mother and then switches on a dime, right? So she's got to be a Gemini, that's for sure. And it's amazing how you handled that. I mean, which makes this character so believable, I think, you know, um, because, oh, cool. Uh, you know, maybe not as crazy as Washu, but people are, uh, people are. Are you saying that you I'm know? schizophrenic? <laughs> Well, you you could you well, could uh, you could portray it probably. I I'm haven't been diagnosed. But I, my dad, I think my dad was kind of undiagnosed bipolar. So there you go. It's nice when you can put that to use and make some money out of it. Huh? There you go. Yeah, whatever you mm-hmm. brought to the table for Washu, it was it was what was needed to be there. And Jack must have brought that out. You know. So again, shout out to Jack. Excellent. <laughs> yep. Yep. One of the uh, one of the other things I wanted to ask was, you know, along those lines. So, like you were talking earlier about the Speed Racer characters. So, was the voice of Washu was that something? Were you thinking of a particular actor or character in mind when you were doing it, or was it just Jack said I need a demonic voice, and that was the first thing that came? Yeah, to he mind? was great because I don't remember him. Like I have a lot of friends who go, "Oh, I'm I'm doing this person from Princess Bride or something like that." They're using that as an inspiration, I've never done that, you know, as a matter of fact, if, um, I mean, it's in, it's in me, right. It, it's not like I haven't seen it, but I don't consciously say I'm going to study that person because to me, um, I want to see what I can come up with myself and I don't want it to be like, Oh, you're just copying blah, blah, blah. That's my own paranoia of somebody thinking it. Right. So, um, I come up with my own stuff and he's really with Washu. It's like, he gives a description of her, and then it's like, what else could it be? And of course, I was influenced by Speed Racer, right? Because I grew up with that as a little kid. So I had those voices. And she sounds very much like Spritel and Trixie, totally like her. And then when she switches down to something, when she's talking about wanting to have her own child, then all of a sudden, it's kind of like nearer to my own voice, but still a little higher than my, my own voice, right? So I don't, um, I don't ever... Like, so the, I think the closest I'll get is like, um, you know, can you use like the kind of like uh, Jonathan Winters, how he switches from one thing to another, you know, like maybe that, but I don't ever really think of, I, I was lucky. Maybe I just didn't, he didn't need to tell me that. Right. I mean, he would say, say this line faster or, uh, you know, can we think of a different thing there? But it was, I don't remember. I mean, it could have happened. You know, I, God, I can't remember when he started filming Tenshi. He could have said, can you do it like some so-and-so? That could have happened, absolutely. 
like, uh, you know, if he said do like Carol Channing or something, that'd be fantastic because you wouldn't think of it. And then you're just kind of doing an impression of them. But um, I can't think of anything offhand that I just do what I think is funny, right? Or what I think works. And I, I don't ever try to be funny, but it's like you're, you're trying to be really truthful to what that character is and not think about it too much, actually. When I think about things too much, I get in my own way and can make something that was funny and organic and bouncing around just kill it. Like um, in plays, you'll you'll uh, people will say, "Oh, when you say this line, it's hilarious." And so I guarantee you, the next performance, no no laughs, because I've I've become aware of it, right? And then if you're lucky, you can let go of it, and once again, it'll become funny. But it's really hard when people put pressure on it. So because I never heard back from anything I did, other than Jack, and we're moving on to the next scene, right? I never had any judgment of what I was doing. Just hope that I would match up stuff right, right? And I trusted him to be able to say, oh, that was fine, moving on. It's very weird. It was fantastic in a lot of ways because there were things you had to concentrate on and trust that you would do, and then you just couldn't think about it. I didn't see what I did until uh, the uh, the di- video, <laughs> at the time, video tape, tape came out. Then I would see it, and of course, you know, I liked certain things, but I was like, oh, I didn't match up that mouth flap well good enough you know you just can't help but be critical then i do you let go of that stuff and it's like it's just weird you know and then to find out that it's popular (laughs) is another thing it's like you're just happy about it but i didn't know what to expect because it was not like anything i've ever done and that show is like nothing else right don't you think it was like the seed that like of a thousand things came out of oh yeah a hundred percent it hooked yeah. us we'd never seen nothing like it there was no, yes. we had nothing in our 12 year old minds before that it was speed racer right that yeah. was it yeah and that was <laughs> came out in like the 70s so the, until tenchi i'm just being naive and somebody can say oh actually you're very mistaken in the mid 80s there was a, i don't know you know i'm not a profession but i'm i'm just saying in my own experience Nothing like that. Oh, I, I kid you not. We have, because, uh, you know, the Tenchi Form community, we have a lot of, you know, the demographics. We have a lot of people our age, in their 30s. We have some people older, 40s and beyond. But we even have some uh, uh, Zoomers, I guess they're calling the younger generation, like teenagers. There are teenagers oh. that are, because wow. they're on streaming services and stuff, right? And there yeah. are teenagers finding Tenchi Muyo now and going, oh my God, well, this is magical. Where, what oh is my this? god how you know? wonderful yeah, yeah when i would watch it i was like i can't understand why i like it so much because it's not logical that i would like this right because i'm somebody who really enjoys i never care who's in a movie right i just want everybody to do a good job and to tell a good story that's what i like so that it's a story that's like it still has really good um storytelling elements so i love that but then there's also wacky stuff but it didn't bother me it's like that's cool, you know. And there are so many beautiful things, and the sound effects it's just—it's like nothing. I I do think that it it um, ages well, you know. Like certain things, you're like that is still good. I think it still has the same. When I watch it, it has the same. I have the same feeling that when I watched it before, it's not like um, certain shows. I was going to say Cosby, but can't even go there. But I mean, certain shows that you'll see, and later on, you're just like, hmm. Just doesn't have the zing it had, right? But um, this one, I I love it. Yeah, it it's still so much of it still holds up, and uh, and you know the animation. Why do you lot think of- it is? I'm just curious from somebody who's you know enjoyed it for so long. Yeah, yeah. I I, I guess I'll go first here. Uh, I mean, I think uh, I'm a believer that quality that never goes out of style. You know, mm-hmm. and so even if uh, something is speaking a little more to a certain time. Uh, or there's certain genre expectations, I think quality is timeless. You know, uh, I, I could put in, uh, you know, a certain like a, a Cagney movie and, uh, you know, I love or it. Marx you know? Brothers. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That That's always funny. And the other thing, too, I think, uh, again, going back to we're watching this in, you know, the year 2000, it was on television and it had an approach to uh, a lot of the Japanese sensibilities, of course, made it very exotic. Uh, so, you yeah. know, sh- Shintoism and uh, blended in there. But, you know, it just it had an approach to fantasy and sci fi that I just, you know, Star Trek and Star Wars. There's a little of that influence in there, but it's it, it nothing like that, you know. So it's it's yeah. just it's very unique. I think it's combination of elements. And I think the the voice cast being one of those to fit these characters, it all just made this a really 
unique experience that it just, you know, you, a 12 year old sees that I'd be game over. Like you're hooked. You're, (laughs) you're hooked. Here we are. So so cool. I mean, most of that I would agree with, but I would also say that, you know, Tenchi Muyo, the greatest strength that Tenchi Muyo has is it has something for everybody. If you are someone who is into shows like Sailor Moon, there's a little bit of Tenchi that reminds you of that. (laughs) If you're, if you're looking at a show that's more like for, you know, more, I guess you'd say young boy oriented, like a DBZ or something, there's some action in there or like, like John was saying here, uh, Star Wars, you know, there lightsabers, there's lightsabers in there. So there's that as well. And then if you're somebody who's into, you know, Mecca or ships, you know, if that's your thing, Tenchi's got it. And so it had all of those elements that like, if you don't like Tenchi Muyo, you don't like anime because Tenchi oh, Muyo has yeah. every or Pokemon, even, you know, Ryo Oki's a yes. little cabot. You've got that as yes. well. So oh my God, yes. Tenchi had a little bit of everything for everybody, and it it, it hooked a lot of people. Yeah, I always absolutely. wish that I got an action figure. You know, I got oh, one, but cool. it's kind of it's kind of it's kind of lame. It's kind of <laughs> like they're all like shaped like salt and pepper shakers or something, like Aww. one with like because you know the the figures of anime are the most beautiful things I've ever seen. And as a little girl, and I still kind of like I love dioramas and I love um, dolls and I love like when um. Nightmare Before Christmas came out. I got those figures and they're worth a fucking fortune. But they looked exactly like the movie. When I was a kid, you would see a movie and then you're like, I want to get a, and I'm just making up shit, Mary Poppins out. It didn't look anything like her, right? But now they have the technology to make things look exactly like that, right? So I got, you know, uh, those figures from Nightmare Before Christmas that looked exactly like the, like they stepped off the screen. And that's what they do with animation, anime now. They have these figures that are so freaking beautiful and well done, you know. And that's like I have looked for washes and I've never found anything that I find satisfying, right? Because it's, it's like if, if you have something, it's like uh, not the literal like thing. But I think they have uh, Tenshi and Ryoko, right? And it's like so beautiful. It's like that that kind of thing is like, I love that idea, you know? I hope we get one for Washu someday because, yeah, you know, right. Ryoko definitely gets, uh, she, she's not really in short supply of getting, you know. I know it's really kind of cool, hurt. though. I mean, we kind of look, you know, the characters look kind of similar and that's totally fine. But I mean, I think, I do think Washu would do well. Oh, you know? she absolutely would. Yeah, I think she'd be like sure. one of those rare ones that you'd want to get. That's just my prediction. You heard it here first, folks. <laughs> That's right. Do it. Do it. Oh, man. Wait, I don't think everybody weighed in on, on the thing. Sorry. No, that's okay. But I mean, kind of to echo a little bit of what Mike and John have said. I mean, since you had a little something for everybody, the Star Wars, Star Trek influence, you know, aspects of Sailor Moon, Magical Girl stuff that was in there. I mean, I had said in a previous podcast that we had done just the design of the characters and how colorful and vibrant they made them. Yeah. Um, you know, Tenchi uh, stood out in that regard for sure. And, yeah. you know, I'll just say it obviously over here, uh, you know, the, the dub that you guys made uh, all those years ago, it's held in very high regards as far as English dubs of anime go. Sweet. Um, you know, stuff like what you guys did is not very commonplace anymore. It's more it's more streamlined, I guess, cookie cutter, best way right, I know to put right. it. Um, yep. You know, Jack giving you guys the freedom that you had doesn't really seem to be the standard anymore. So if you take away nothing else from all this, the dub that you guys made held in very high regard amongst the wider anime community for sure. Wow, I never thought that we might have been in the heyday. <laughs> that was pretty cool. Oh, well, yeah. Back in the 90s. Back in the, in the 1990s with the gold rush. Well, well that I was mean, the 1890s. Well, that's why we got to ask you about some of these uh, conventions and stuff in the 90s, because we have fans and, and you know, people who are going to listen to this that were not alive yet. Oh. <laughs> you know, when Tinchy was I first know, coming out, you know, so it's right. crazy. <laughs> right. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's kind of interesting because my daughter never really watched them because she wasn't around friends who did right so she doesn't have the same so i i'm I'm kept in a kind of a weird uh reality and that i don't know unless somebody tells me 
how popular something is. And because it's not, it's anime, it was a long time ago. And the only person who did that for me was my uh, sister-in-law, right? Because she taught kids who were like, she doesn't watch you, you know? I was like, what? You know, because they were kids. And I was like, that's, that's still going on. And that was a long time ago, right? And so that was so lovely and such a size. You're, you're going to see, and, and we'll uh, inform you of the various places you can, you know, you listen to other episodes of Tenchi Cast, and one of them being, uh, you know, YouTube. Uh-oh. And, uh, you know, you'll see the metrics. You'll see how many people are, are going to be thrilled just to go, oh my gosh, it's, it's Katie Vo. She's talking about Washu. It's, it's going to catch a lot of people's uh, attention. You might not have been familiar with this series that came out. This was back in 2014. Um, yes. Yeah, did you hear about that uh, series called I Tenchi Muyo? Yes, but I don't know anything about it. Okay, yeah, we were just going to ask if, um, because basically the folks who were in charge of dubbing Tenchi after Pioneer in like the, you know, 2000s uh, Funimation, they did not have a a super great track record. You know, well, for example, uh, you know, Patria shared only recently because, you know, she never wants to talk bad about anyone. But, you know, she shared recently at a convention and she shared with us that like for the uh, the o- the OVA three installment anyway, where she didn't reprise her role, they just they just did it behind her back, you know. Oh, yeah. Um, and uh, that's pretty unprofessional. But anyway, so basically with a lot of um, uh, a lot of fans unhappy about that, um, they caught Matt and Patria back for eye tension. But we were it was a short, fun little series, but we we were just kind of curious if you know were you approached it for that at all or not at all did mm. they have different did they have a different watch you they, they did. did and boy oh, cool. she did you know a capable actress but boy did not it d- didn't hold a candle to your portrayal that's so and, sweet and we're not yeah. just <laughs> not just saying that well, uh, <laughs> that's really sweet yeah a lot of times and this happens with actors a lot like um the Powerpuff Girls, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's right. I think that's a series that, which my daughter loved when she was a little kid. That's why I know about it, right? Because I watched it with her. I was like, hey, this is good. But um, they did a reboot of it, and none of the original girls were asked. Mm-hmm. And, and and Jack was involved. I think I think he might have done the Powerpuff Girls. And I don't know if he did it either or if he did have to direct it and find new people. So they do that all the time. Uh, unfortunately, in many cases, the actor is very, very low in consideration because they just assume that they can do it cheaper and not. And they, you know, they could have done a phone call and it would have worked out, but they don't even do any effort. They're like, oh, we're just going to do this. Mm-hmm. You know, and they do a lot of assumptions as to whether somebody's available or I don't know what they're what the idea is but um that happens all the time i'm really glad that at least patria and matt got to do it they were the main characters so that's that's great but no nothing was ever Mm. you know at all didn't even know about it wow i mean then that happens a lot i'm just saying that happens a lot so it's interesting you know i think with uh, social media and stuff being what it is now i i think companies are having to adjust to that reality because i even i remember i didn't see the new Powerpuff Girls, but I remember people talking about that and people being disappointed at, you know, the recasting. And so now all of a sudden you've got, you know, fans can go to Twitter or wherever and go, oh, Oh, hey, we want so and so back. And so I think a little bit of that, you know, kind of happened with, uh, you know, people were not, you know, people were going, where's Patria in, you know, back in early 2000s. I think you and Matt were there, but, you know, um, again, another capable uh, actor but you know she was just not she patria has a pretty unique voice as well oh yeah to that character voice. and so people yeah. immediately do this wait a minute that's that doesn't sound like ryoko right. so yeah maybe i think uh, i remember like when they had a, a reboot like in 2000 something right something was going yeah. on mm-hmm. and i was hired and then i read somebody review my voice and somebody said she sounds so tired and i was like ew but you know that's the thing is like trolls are real you know, yeah. and, and, and you're like, so they're comparing me to, and I think I had just had a kid too. So it was like, okay, I probably was retired, but it was like one of those things where you're just like, and Jack wasn't directing, right? I couldn't tell me if it was different than it was before. And I don't know, I don't think I ever heard it. So I can't say if I thought it was okay or not. It was, it was, it was kind of interesting to see for the first time, just happened to notice, you know, that there was like some harsh criticism about my performance. And I was like, oh, that's rough. But, you know, that happens. 
So it was, it was very weird. And it didn't last very long. I didn't do very many episodes, I don't, I don't think. I don't think it went on for very long. I don't know. It was very weird. Like you probably what? know about it better than me. Yeah, it was like six. Was it six episodes? Seven, Mike? It was, uh, it was seven. I guess so. And they were trying to continue the uh, OVA. that Right. And then they had a different director because they didn't want to work with jack anymore so mm. it, it had already started right that was yeah that was actually one of the things i wanted to ask was you know like john had just got done saying you know once pioneer was out of the picture the tenchi franchise had moved over to funimation and basically what was your experience like working with them because with jack and pioneer it felt like you guys had a lot of time you know jack let you yeah. guys have a lot of yeah, well, no, it was um, like, you know, if you just look at it, and I know you do, if you just look at it, at, at what's happening to the world is um, things becoming corporate and things becoming cookie cutter, you use the word yourself, things becoming, let's, let's um, throw it out there because there's 500 million stations. And so they're hoping people don't notice. But then you have fans like you guys, who freaking notice shit, right? So it's like a weird thing about trying to, to trick the people or lull the people into thinking that this is okay. And then there's always a few who are like, that's fucked up, right? What can we do about it? And then sometimes you're able to do something about it. And sometimes you just know the, the thing that you enjoyed that no longer exists. And that's happened in our world so many times. And here's my weird analogy for it, okay? In the late 1990s, I, was, I would always shop at this Vons that was on uh, Los Feliz uh, Street. And I would always go in there and I I would primarily shop there. So I got to know the people who worked there. And there was a very old man who I think took the the, um, job when he was an older man, or maybe he'd worked there forever. But also they would wear placards that say, I've worked here since 1979, extremely long times. Like right out of high school, they got that job because they knew that it was a good corporation that would give them a pension. It was like, you know, how the 1950s America that we thought still existed, right? So in the late 1990s, they got rid of all the unions and all the grocery stores. All the people that were promised pensions, those pensions were gone. And you mm-hmm. know people that, that happened to, right? Mm-hmm. Probably your parents or grandparents. And it, ha- and it started happening there and then it started happening everywhere. But that was the one that was personal for me because I actually knew these people. Working there since 1979, I remember somebody's car- thing. They said, I had a pension. It doesn't exist anymore. And now I'm working here for minimum wage, Mm. this job I've worked at my whole life. So, of course, it's going to be in other aspects of the world. Art imitates life, right? So if it happened there, of course, it's going to happen with Tenchi. It's going to happen with many things, you know. But what's great is that when people notice and you notice. And so that's important, you know. And noticing, you might not think, is is a very active take on what that, but it is. You know, to notice something like that, that's how things shift and to be able to voice what you like and what you what you find valuable. So when you put things out in the world, you're doing that. You know, you have a say and you're not just settling for and it can be very small. It doesn't have to be dramatic because then you I don't know, I, I think I'd go to an anxiety spin if I had to make it a huge thing. But, yeah, they did it with so much stuff. You guys know you probably saw it happen in your school room. Right. When your schoolroom changed, like when this might have been after you graduated, though, but my same sister in law that would get me to draw those pictures was voted best teacher every year. She had like so many apples. She got a golden apple every year for getting best teacher. Just so many that they they had to keep several of them in the garage because how many can you put on a bookcase without being just like, what the fuck, you know, but from going to the best teacher to not being valued at all and not being able to teach how you taught before. Because you're starting to get more, well, let's say Russian, like squelching creativity, cutting the arts, no more after school programs, no more, all these things going, you know, and it's, it's heartbreaking for people who saw what it was like before. I think you guys actually had it pretty good. And then it started collapsing. And now you get to see where you are in the world and how it's affecting you now. But it's, if you went back to the schools you went to, It's different. And maybe that's why the teenagers now are drawn to things outside of school because the schools can't satisfy them. And schools haven't evolved with how humanity is evolving or human beings are evolving. You don't sit there and tell students, you ask them stuff. That's how you learn. And you fucking listen. And you don't think you have all the answers. And that is the opposite of what we're doing now. And that's so scary, you know? So I'm glad 
that you are doing this podcast. It's profound and important. And how you feel about this, you know, and for what you put out in the world, that's everything. Well, thank you, Katie. I mean, it's like you said, this is a, this is a small little sphere when there's so much else going on in the wider world, but you know, I guess yeah, you you do your little part, you know, and if everybody does their little part, that amounts to something. I, I and also here's the thing is like, I kind of feel like, I don't know if it's because I was raised Catholic or something is like, you aren't allowed to like enjoy things, right? You're making a difference. And you're enjoying it. And that's actually how it's supposed to be. Did you know that? I feel validated that you said that. <laughs> but it's true. Because there are some people that the uh, they just, yeah, that you're not supposed to be having fun while Haters you're, gotta hate you know, them. yeah. <laughs> like, and I'm also, sorry. <laughs> they, weren't, they weren't kind to themselves in that way, right? They're like, I didn't have fun. Why should you have fun? It's like, so we're going to keep on propagating that because it didn't work for you. How about the idea of you actually enjoying something? Because you get to, and you should, you know, enjoy it. It's okay. Why else are we here? (laughs) Why else are we here? And I love that you're doing what you love. I mean, I have to assume you love this, right? Oh yeah. We have to be, to be doing this. That's everything. (laughs) And that, yeah. And I'm saying that, that the fact that you love it is putting out goodness in the world. So it is. And you, you might be surprised that this may be the best thing you could possibly do because of the goodness that it is. It connects with other people. It gives people hope. And it's, it's friendly. That's everything, you guys, honestly. Well, thank you, KT. You know, I, we all met, as we said here, these are really good friends of mine now. And we've met a lot of people, and you included now. The initial impetus was this show called Tenchi Muyo. But through that, mm-hmm. you know, we get a lot of people and they've stayed and some come and go, but they come back. And we've always just tried to uh, have good vibes. And a lot of people come back to our community. We have a discord, which is like, uh, you know, kind of like a chat room basically, but uh, combined with like internet forums, how they used to be. And a lot of people, we don't even talk about Tenchi every day, right? It's just a yeah. shelter from the storm, That's right. you know, for and people. So yeah, what you've done is much bigger than Tenchi, right? Tenchi was the seed. And then what grew out of it is might not even resemble Tenchi, but it, it's something that came out of something that you came to for mutual love and communication and communication is the thing that's going to save everybody. And that's what you're doing. You know, the only problem with anything is that they're not communicating. It's the only problem with the Ukraine and and Russia lies and no communication. Russians don't know what's happening. They don't know the reality of what's happening. Can you imagine? Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, we can imagine because it happens every day here, but I mean, in such a large scale, Mm -hmm. it's like there's the results of people not being able to communicate. Yeah. That's some, some scary stuff going on right now, really. And uh, yep. I mean, I, I tune it out a lot, to be honest, because it's just... Well, you that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a lot right now, you know? And I am a, not a person who ever reads or watches the news, right? That um, probably does wonders I, for mental health, honestly. I, I, I see John, my news is from John Oliver and I'll skim. I love that he... Well, here's what I love that he does. He shows light on just one thing that you actually can do something about. Every episode, it's like, you know, this is how they do this. And, you know, all you have to do is do that. He, he's like radical, you know, he he's sheds light good. on how things are. Done. Yes. Yeah. And he, yeah. he empowers his viewers. Yeah. I mean, and uh, certainly says things and is is candid about things that you're not going to hear. Corporate media want to frame it that way or say it that way. Uh, That's so right. It, it's very refreshing. And you hear someone saying like that and like you said, communication stuff and you, you kind of go, Oh, I'm not crazy then, you know, no. like I, I'm not and the only like, one. Oh, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. That's, he's my touchstone, right? You know, that he can insult AT&T when that's a sponsor. That's, that's what freedom is. And that's what this country was supposed to be about. You know, I'm glad we, we have him and, you know, I, I miss John Stewart doing that, you know, oh, I liked yeah. him he's years ago, but, uh, but he's still oh, yeah. been doing some good things too. Oh, yeah. He's but... doing, he's, he's still doing the good work. That's for sure. Yeah. I have to say yeah. my favorite was Stephen Colbert. Oh yeah. He was, he was brilliant. I mean, he just, yeah. the, the, that persona that he had, I mean, like oh, you God. said earlier, don't break character, you know, uh-huh. and, mm-hmm. uh, he would have some very serious people on and talk about serious things, but he never, that I ever saw, he never broke that character when he no, was doing no. the Colbert report, you know, <laughs> and it got him in really interesting situations, right? He found this niche that nobody else even thought of as probably a joke at first. And then he's like, wait a minute, 
what's happening with this? Let's, let's explore it more. I don't know what he did, but that to me is like, it's great because he was able to shed light on things without the people who were shedding light on even know that it was happening. And that's power. That's beautiful. That's strong communication. Yeah. Well, it's crazy. Cause you know, again, yeah, him and John Stewart, I remember in the, you know, two thousands, you know, and it's like, you just, I bet uh, people just didn't, th- they're on comedy central, you know, the network's comedy central. Yeah. And yet, you know, you, I'd go there, you go there for serious news, you know, yeah. I mean, they'd be funny about it, but that's genius though. You know, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's because great, it's kind of like in. the opposite of Fox. They don't make any claims. So nobody can do anything to them. They can't sue them. They can't do anything, which is what those people want to do because they're like, Oh, it's on a comedy station. So nobody's going to take them seriously. Right. Mm-hmm. And that, so that was the genius of it. It's like, you know, whereas you have Fox, which is the original comedy station, but those people, well, I don't even think all the people who are on that really believe what they're saying. It's just that they can do it. Right? Oh, it's a job. Yeah. For a lot of them, yeah. it's just, yeah, okay, give me the money and exactly. You know, I'll say what you want. To and, say. Then I'll, <laughs> and then and then I'll live live with myself somehow. Yeah. I, Your generation is is the promise, it's the hope. Because yeah. um, you know, a lot of a lot of bad shits happened and a lot of good things too. But you don't you don't hear about those. But then when you have this, this experience I had today with you, it's like then you remember, oh yeah, this does exist. And yeah. I'm grateful for it. I'm so glad that I got to be here today and spend an afternoon with you guys. I really am grateful and I appreciate it and I'm glad that I got to know you a little. And I want to listen to all your podcasts now. <laughs> so send me the information. So we got I quite can. a backlog, so we will do Excellent. that. And uh, Thank it's, you. it's just been a thrill meeting you as well. I, I Thank remember, you. Uh, I remember saying that with you know Patria and Matt, and just how what a world where you know I I would never have believed you know twenty some years ago that these voices I was hearing on television that I would I would get to know them a little bit. You know, Isn't years cool? later. <laughs> and then, so think about that, and think what other wonderful things can happen that you have no idea how it's going to happen. So if you're open like that, that stuff just happens, right? And it's like normal. Yeah. So that's that's the good that's the good thing. You know, we only hear the bad stuff, and that's kind of why I don't do a lot of news, is because the good also exists, and you guys are embodying. It. So, so well, thank you. Thank you. We're trying. Hey, I don't know if I'm. I, I did not know coming in today that I would feel the vindication and validation from you know the voice of Washu. That is something I did not <laughs> did not ever dream that I would get. <laughs> But I have to I have to ask one more thing and then we'll let you go because we would sure. keep you all afternoon uh, if we didn't. 1992 was the first year that Tenshi came out. It's yeah. now 2022. It's oh, my thir- gosh. It's 30 years of Tenshi. What are your feelings about Washu looking back at 30 years of Tenshi and just in general? I have real gratitude and it's also surreal because it was 30 years ago, right? I'm grateful that it still has meaning for people and in in that even if it's as an enjoyment or it has deeper meaning, how lucky am I that I got to be a small part of that? And I'm so grateful, especially, like I said, the young people, because you are important and you're doing what is needed and you're not so taken in by stuff. Like I don't think anywhere... I'm going to segue again. Sorry. I don't think anywhere in um, history has there been a time where the mother will say to the child, all right, I want you to have my sideboard and my Steinway. And the child saying, no, thank you. Cause you just don't care about stuff anymore. You can't haul that shit anymore. You don't want it. And the parents don't believe it. Cause in, in previous generations, the siblings would be fighting over who got the Steinway and the sideboard. And these days, you're like, I'm traveling light. That's how it has to be. And that's really how the world has to be. And Americans are so, God, we just love our fucking stuff. You know, but you're traveling lightly and you have the power of this podcast, which is doesn't require any stuff at all. But it's it's important and profound. Well, you know, I yeah, I, I've kind of felt a little bit of that. Uh, I, I suspected that generational gap. But so again, like Mike said, it. Yeah, you know, something like 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 what we're doing here, like this is this is a life experience. This is something that, you know, we'll never we'll never forget. Yeah. And uh you can't put a price on it, you know. Nope. I mean, so yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, well they say about those things, it's like a cliche, but they'll say on a deathbed, you're never you're never gonna say, God, I wish you had more stuff. 
<laughs> I mean, I right. mean, other than Trump saying that he's the only one who would say that. But everybody else, everybody else would be like, I wish I spent more time with my kids or I wish I didn't worry so much or I wish I did a podcast, you know, <laughs> I, I mean, really, that's that's the kind of thing that is like important. That's really important. And I feel like your generation knows that now. And some people, the other generations, not everybody, but a lot of people didn't get it until they were very much older than you, but you're having to deal with so much stuff and it's making you evolve quicker because you have to. With that, we end another episode of the interview adventures. And again, thank you so much, KT for talking with us today. Thank you boys. I had such a great time. If you liked what you heard, make sure to subscribe to us on YouTube. Check us out on Spotify, Apple podcasts, Wherever you get your podcasting fix, we are there. And be sure to follow us on Twitter, Tumblr, Instagram, and jump in our Discord to hear what Tenchi fandom is up to and what we're doing next. Until next time, stay gold. <laughs> <laughs>